Hi and welcome to lecture one of my introductory course on bitcoins. In this lecture we're going to be discussing some of the core foundational introductory information that's required to really deeply understand the bitcoin. I make the assumption throughout this entire course that number one you have no technical skills meaning you're not a computer programmer or an IT expert and number two you have just heard about the bitcoin maybe it was in the Wall Street Journal or maybe it was in um, New York Times or perhaps some sort of thing on CNBC where people were talking about this and you said a bit what? Uh, and that's exactly what we're looking for is a person who knows nothing about the Bitcoin. But by the end of this course, you'll actually know a great deal about the Bitcoin. In fact, so much, you'll probably be a local expert. So let's get started. To understand a bit about the Bitcoin, the first thing that we really need to discuss is money. Money is not generally something people think about. It's, uh, it's one of those things in life that just tends to work. When you pull out a $20 bill from your wallet, when you pull out those 10 euros and buy something with it, you kind of take that for granted. And only if you're in economics or finance do you really stop and take a step back and say, well, wait a minute here, what exactly is this? And why do I need this? And oh, how does this work? And it's actually a very deep and very complex topic. And we'll be discussing just enough to be able to give you a keen sense of why money is necessary and why the Bitcoin is special. After we discuss money, uh, we're going to go ahead and transition very quickly into the Bitcoin. And this is kind of a rough view of it. And we're going to drill down much deeper in the subsequent lectures on specific topics of the Bitcoin. But at the end of this lecture, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the Bitcoin is. Then we're going to discuss why are Bitcoins special. Bitcoins are a very unique type of currency. In fact, the very first peer-to-peer -peer distributed currency ever conceived that seem to work and they're incredibly secure and so we're going to discuss that and um, kind of give you a really strong understanding of what makes them unique then of course it's necessary to discuss who controls the Bitcoin the reason being is that unlike normal money the control of the Bitcoin works very very differently and it's important that you understand uh, the controlling forces within the Bitcoin how it can go wrong where it can go right uh, so you can avoid some of the misinformation that tends to be flowing around just due to ignorance. Of course, it's natural to ask with any currency or any commodity, why is it worth something? Why is gold worth something? Why is silver worth something? And so we'll ask the exact same question with the Bitcoin. And finally, we'll go ahead and introduce a couple of wonderful links that are great introductions to get you started inside the Bitcoin world. First, it's going to connect you to a lot of uh, websites that specialize in discussing the Bitcoin. And there's some intro videos that are probably even better than mine, to be honest, uh, that I would highly recommend just to get you started with the Bitcoin. OK, so let's start with money. What is money? When I took economics years ago, money was explained to me by an elucidating story. So the very first thing human beings started doing when we started to communicate with each other was barter. Barter is when I have something you want and you have something I want. We come together and we agree to exchange it. For example, I could be a neurosurgeon and you could be a baker. So maybe you have brain cancer and I go to you and say, if you give me bread for the rest of your life, I'll go ahead and operate on you and save your life. As a baker, you'd be like, okay, that's kind of a fair deal. There's not many neurosurgeons floating around, and you know, I have lots of surplus bread, so that seems like a legitimate deal. Well, here's the problem. A vast majority of bakers do not have brain cancer. So even though I, as a neurosurgeon, have a skill that is incredibly valuable, it's very rare, it takes decades to refine and develop, I'm probably going to starve to death because I have no utility to society outside of this very small subset. And if I had to barter with people to survive, I, unless I live in a massive community and I got really lucky about the people who develop brain cancer or brain trauma, I probably would not make it. And so in a barter-based society, people with very specialized skills don't tend to do very well. And this is a problem because the key to advancing, the key to growing quickly, is specialization. Imagine if everybody, in addition to being an engineer or a mathematician or a rocket scientist, also had to be a farmer. 
this would cause problems. So we said, how about we go ahead and develop something that lets the neurosurgeon be a neurosurgeon, but also prevents him from starving to death. And that's kind of money. Money is usually defined in terms of three functions. The first is a means of exchange. The second is a store of value, and the third is a unit of account. So when we think about money, we say first, we don't want to build a society where every time you want something, you have to find something that that person who has it wants. Instead, let's create a standard unit, a dollar, a pound, a euro, where the neurosurgeon can acquire these by doing his job and then spend them any way he or she sees fit. And so when he goes to the baker, the baker will agree to exchange bread for this standard unit of exchange. Another problem is, Bread is a finite commodity. It tends to decay over time. It tends to rot. Or if you will, maybe we can talk about a person who raises chickens. Chickens tend to die. So it's really difficult if your currency or your money was chickens or bread to store value because your store is very large. It's very hard to move around. It's difficult to go ahead and find people who'd want that many chickens at a particular period of time. So money is an intermediary that removes commodities completely and barter completely and it allows us to store arbitrary amounts of value so the neurosurgeon for example because he has highly specialized skills is probably going to be paid a lot of money and the neurosurgeon can amass large sums of money to do things like buy homes or buy cars or whatever he or she desires the last thing is standardization of account a unit of account how difficult would it be, using our neurosurgeon and baker dilemma problem, for the baker to properly price or the neurosurgeon to properly price their skills in relation to each other? So think about a baker who doesn't have brain cancer and the neurosurgeon says, well, I'll make you a deal. If you ever do develop it, I'll go ahead and give you my operation for free. Okay. That's a one-time thing. So I guess the baker's bread is worth that. But what happens when the mechanic comes to the baker? Is he going to get lifetime bread or bread for a year or bread for six months? And how does the baker relate with the grain grower? So we said, hey, let's create this thing called money. Let's put a number on the money. And then people can kind of make a decision through a market process of either being told it's too high or you know, over uh, overselling so they know it's too low, of kind of basically deciding what the value of things are through a free market system. And so a unit of account is very convenient. For example, if you go into King Supers or into Safeway, you see a loaf of bread is a dollar, or some donuts are two dollars and fifty cents, for example. Okay, you understand what that means. You understand what money means within your local economy, and then you can kind of get an idea of what's expensive and what's cheap. For example, you know how to price a Lamborghini versus a Ford Fusion. Okay, there are a couple of other things we tend to think about in terms of money. We also tend to care about divisibility. So when I have a dollar, it would be nice if I could break that dollar into smaller parts. For example, I probably wouldn't want to pay for a gumball machine a dollar for a gumball. So what do we do? We pay a quarter or a dime, for example. So we're able to break the dollar into smaller parts. Or if I have a $100 bill, there are ways of purchasing even a small item, like a loaf of bread, for example, and then breaking that into smaller pieces so that I can use those smaller pieces at a later date and the merchant who receives that bill also can do the same. So divisibility is a property of money that's necessary. Durability is another property of money that's necessary. So in paper-based currencies, the durability is usually measured in terms of years. With uh, metal-based currencies like coinage, the durability can be decades, if not centuries. In fact, some currencies like Roman coins, Greek coins, uh, have been around for thousands of years, which tell you that durability is something that uh, is a uh, prerequisite for good money. Fungibility is another term that you probably haven't heard. Um, it's a it's an odd term. It comes from the commodity markets. Fungibility means we don't care about one versus the other. So if I pull out a dollar bill and you pull out a dollar bill and we put them on the table and we look at them, they're identical except for the serial number. And that doesn't matter in terms of value, its accounting unit, or its exchange process. So the fungibility is basically saying you don't care about one dollar versus another dollar. You can think of it as like bushels of wheat. 
one bushel of wheat, as long as it's the same size, ought to be treated the same as another bushel of wheat. They're fundamentally fungible. That's the term. And then finally, verifiability. It's really important that we understand that the money that we receive is indeed legitimate money. And everybody agrees that that is the money that the society is going to be using. I can't just write one dollar on a piece of paper and hand it to you. It has to be verifiable as a true dollar. Okay, so that's kind of money in a nutshell. It's something that resolves a dilemma of specialization and allows us to buy things that we want without having to barter for every single thing. We store value, we understand what prices are, and we have these interesting properties like divisibility and verifiability attached. So a very natural question is, why is money worth anything? In a more abstract sense, why is anything worth anything? Well, it's worth something because a group of people agree to exchange it in turn for goods and services. You can take a hundred dollars and go and buy something with that. You can get food. You can get a hotel room. You can rent a car. You can uh, you can go ahead and you know, pay a toll to go to a national park and see a beautiful vista. You can buy a cheap camera. There are things you can do with that money because society, whatever society you happen to live in and whatever money you happen to be spending, has agreed to accept that money to exchange goods and services. We also acknowledge that some authority has to be in charge of validating and maintaining that money. We can't just go ahead and make up our own money, walk around, and then you know, independently negotiate with people to go ahead and start accepting this money, because then we're back to bartering. We've just abstracted it to something that we do ourselves. Instead, what we do is we say, OK, Federal Reserve System, or Central Bank of Europe, or Central Bank of China, you are in charge of the currency of our people, and you validate it, and you maintain it, and you take care of it, and then you deal with other proxies to print it and to distribute it and so forth, and we will agree to exchange it for services and money. But we entrust a small group of people, some sort of authority, who is special to validate and maintain our currency. And currencies tend to also be backed by something such as an attachment to the respect of the entity that backs it. So we trust the Federal Reserve System for the most part. We say this is an entity that uh, is good and it makes great decisions. Although we'll get to that a little bit later that maybe why we shouldn't. Or um, some sort of finite resource. Some currencies are backed by resources like gold or silver. Uh, they can be backed by services guaranteed by a government or a, an issuing agency, for example. So. In a nutshell, monies are worth something because we agree to exchange goods and services for them. Some sort of authority agrees to validate and maintain it, and currencies are usually backed in some way or another by uh, either respect, that's called a fiat currency, or a resource like gold. So what's the problem? Why do we just always use money? Why do we need to invent new kinds of monies? Why is the dollar not sufficient? Well, here's one of the biggest issues. A small group of people decide how to regulate and manage the currency. And the reason why this is a problem is this picture. So this is the $100 trillion bill. I remember reading about a rancher in Zimbabwe who decided to retire in 2001. And he'd worked very hard. He worked for 30 years. And he was so incredibly excited that he could sell his land and all of his cattle. He had thousands upon thousands of cattle and this huge, huge ranch, and he sold it. And he made millions of Zimbabwean dollars. And at the time, the exchange rate was pretty comparable with the United States. It wasn't too bad. So he, he was going to live very, very well, basically equivalent to what, how a millionaire in the United States would live.